I have really come to feel that that being gay is one of the great blessings of my life. I think part of our earthly experience is the struggle, is the wrestle. You made it very, very easy to say, we're brothers, we're still together, we're a family, and, and we, our love hasn't changed. I don't think that any of what we did was based on, well, let's do this so Tom will come back to church. And our prayers were help Tom to be happy. I, I don't think that we should love someone with a goal in mind that we love them so they will be a church member or be fully active in the church, but we love someone because we genuinely love them. And we're all in it together. You know, we really are. I hope that when people hear the story of our family, they understand that the happy ending is not that I came back to church, although I'm grateful for that, obviously. The happy ending is that our family remained united in love throughout this journey. I'm the youngest of five boys in my family, and we moved to New Jersey when I was three. I think because we had moved, uh, you know, as a family to New Jersey, um, the thing that was most distinctive about us was being Mormons in a community that was where that was kind of unheard of, really. Nobody else was. We had a good family dynamic. It was kind of uh, the Cleavers and uh, Mayberry. That's how I look at it now. I was closest to Tom because I was just older than he was. I think I was a pretty happy kid. I had lots of friends, and you know, but I also always felt, I think, a little bit apart. And partially because from about age five, I knew there was something different about me. Looking back, you know, he had a lot of friends, uh, a lot of girls who were good friends, a lot of guys who were friends, but never really close to... Um, you know, a serious dating relationship with girls, so maybe there were some clues there that I missed. I don't even remember when I first heard the word homosexual, but I do remember in junior high school, I went to the library to the giant copy of the Oxford English Dictionary and looked up the word homosexual, and as I read that definition, I knew it was me. I developed a sense that if people really knew who I was, they wouldn't want to be with me, they wouldn't like me. When I was 12, uh, the Stonewall Riots took place in New York City, 1969, and that was the, probably the first awareness many people had in the country of, of a gay pride movement. And in that instance, it probably was not a positive awareness. It reinforced the notion that I had that I couldn't be gay because gay was a negative thing. I knew the expectation was that I was going to go on a mission. That had been my expectation. But especially my second semester of my freshman year, I really thought, do I know, do I have enough of a testimony to do this? Is this really the right thing for me? And where do I fit? When I finally came to the conclusion that, that I could serve a mission that I wanted to, that I was ready to go, I really felt that if I did the best I could as a missionary, if I tried to serve faithfully and uh, could bring the message of the gospel to other people, that somehow my reward for doing this was going to be that the, that the Lord was going to make me not be gay anymore. It was a shock to me, honestly, when I got back and realized that I was still gay. I had some suspicion, but it was his desire to get married and have a family, and so he pursued that, and I assumed that all was going to be well with that situation. That marriage was never consummated. It wasn't something that I could do. I finally just felt like, okay, I've, I've done everything I can think of to do to try to follow the, the Mormon path. So the only thing I can do now is try to figure out what it means to be gay. And so I felt like if, if I had any integrity at all, I needed to not be Mormon. And, and that meant not simply not going to church, but, but to go ask to be excommunicated, to, to literally not be Mormon that you know, Tom had come out as being gay, was uh, divorced and out of the church. And I was just mad, upset, angry, and I thought, how can you betray our family? My first reaction was, well, let's fix this. 
and I have a friend who was over all of uh, Southern California LDS social services. We'd always been taught that being gay or being a homosexual was behavioral. You chose to be that way. And he's saying, no, that's not a choice. It's who you are. Greg's reaction was very loving and you know, the, uh, you had the insurance that nothing would change, that he was still my brother and would love me. Especially worried about mom and dad. Um, and Tom and I talked about, you know, how he would tell them. When I talked to my parents, I don't remember what they said. I knew that they loved me, but this news really struck at the foundation of everything that was critical to them. And yet I never had a sense that they were going to choose between the church and their child. You know, this struck a blow to their dreams for my life. This was not what they had imagined my life to be. They took it hard. Uh, I remember Dad saying to me, this must be my fault. What have I done wrong? I uh, was very surprised. Um, and I thought it would pass. You know, I remember talking about it with Mother. Oh, two or three years, this will pass. <laughs> uh, but it was, uh, it didn't interrupt the relationship in the family. And I think a large part of that is uh, due to Tom, who wanted it, the relationship to be constant, to be maintained. That feeling was really reciprocated, that my brothers and their wives and over time my nieces and nephews, but especially my parents, wanted to show their desire to be a part of my life, whatever that meant. You know, my real life, not, not some version they hoped it would be. I think there was spiritual guidance here. They prayed for it, and they asked for it, and they got it. I think about two years after I had come out, we were having a family reunion. After we'd put the kids to bed that night, and we'd all gone into Mom and Dad's room and had a prayer, uh, Dad talked about his feeling of the importance of unity and, and of loyalty. And then Mom said, said, uh, said I'm ashamed to say this, she said, I thought we were the perfect Mormon family. He said, I've come to realize not only is there not a perfect Mormon family, there's no perfect family, but I really believe, she said, that we can be perfect in loving each other. And then she turned to my brothers and their wives and she said, you know, the most important lesson that your kids will learn from how our family treats Uncle Tom is that nothing they can ever do will take them outside the circle of our family's love. But if you want to know how to build family unity, put five boys in an unair-conditioned Chevy <laughs> drive from New Jersey to Utah in the summer. And After that, up. everything looks good. <laughs> <laughs> I think they never tried to hide that Tom's gay. There was a lot of it where they were just feeling their way. All yes. of us yeah. were yeah. kind of feeling our way. And sometimes that was a dead end. We'd have to back up and try something else. And Again, Tom made it easy because he was hard to offend. He didn't take offense easily, and he, uh, you know, he forgave quickly too, where there was an offense unintended. But uh, I think there was spiritual guidance here. They prayed for it, yeah. and they asked for it, and they got it. They got uh, all of us. Hopefully, got some of that guidance of the Holy Spirit in this process. I think that developed uh, a feeling within the family that, you know, what does it really mean to love in a Christ-like manner? That's really it in a nutshell. They, they kept their anchor uh, firmly grounded, uh, never changed their principles or beliefs or feelings or thoughts about the Savior and about the priesthood and the gospel and the temple and all those things that are so important to all of us. Uh, that never changed. You know, I think some people get worried about condoning. Yeah. You know, that we'll, we'll, in our parents' circumstances, will Tom understand what we believe if, if we're too accepting or too loving somehow. And somehow they, they seemingly didn't really worry about that. If, somebody, if a grandchild were to have come to mom and said, is what Uncle Tom is doing right, you know, as far as the homosexual relationship with a partner, 
she would have said no, it's not. Uh, at the same time, and, and she did do this, you know, say in different ways at different times, he's part of our family and that won't change. Yeah. And that was the, I think what, what helped younger members of the family, the children, the grandchildren, um, our children and their grandchildren, understand that, that you can live that way, you know. <laughs> you can love without condoning and that's not an issue. It doesn't need to be an issue anyway. And that was the, the big force and strength of their example, that they could continue to live the, church, live the gospel, be faithful in the church, and, and live that example, but also live the example of Christ-like love, of, a, of a unconditional love, and a desire of their family to be close and united. I, I th you know, a couple lessons that I learned from, our, from my brothers and from my parents that um, the desire to stay connected um, is, isn't always easy, but it is always right. You know, we're kind of at a happy spot, uh, the Tom and Full Fellowship. But it always wasn't that way. And I think there's families out there who that might not happen. They should still not consider their child a project or something that they need to to make come back to the church or something like that, but to just still enjoy that person in their life and to still encourage the relationships, yeah. the things like that. The not a failure. Yeah, whether or not the person ever comes back to the church or not. I'd say, you know, people generally are trying to do the best they can. They need love more than judgment. And I think um, going through this whole experience over 20, 30 years with Tom is, develop that uh, feeling. <laughs> I was going to say, what an example this has been to our children who love Uncle Tom so much and have seen, uh, have, have seen the sacrifices that he has made to come back to church and to be close to the Savior. I think the bottom line is though we should all recognize that, that there are sacrifices. Sometimes yeah. there are sacrifices. Yeah. And, um, the Lord has never said it would be otherwise. In fact, they, they, they often draw us closer to Him. We've had the conversation before about you know, what was the process of coming back to church. And at its simplest level, it was feeling the Spirit and wanting to feel it more. Feeling it and wanting to feel it more consistently and more strongly. And that, that was what kind of led the day-by-day -day path or the daily bread path. Uh, was just, I don't know how, how this is going to resolve. I don't know where it will land or how it works. but Or what the path is. But, yeah. yeah, but this is sweet and I want to have it. As Tom, Tom expressed it once, more than once, uh, part of the consequence has been learning to live with some ambiguity. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, where we don't have all the answers yet. Yeah. Yeah. And um, all the understanding we want to have and hopefully in due course we'll have. Um, but you go forward, you know, you go forward, you go forward with your gospel commitments and everything else and, and the family relationships and without having all the answers. You know, the great news for me and I hope for everyone else is that that path allows me to be holy me as a happy gay Mormon. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't have to dissociate when I was able to figure out how how it all come together, I didn't have to dissociate myself from the things that matter most in my life. Including us. Including my brother. <laughs> so when Tom first started coming to church, apparently I, no, nobody knew he was coming because he would sneak in late after the meeting started and make sure he ducked out before the closing prayer. When I decided I wanted to go back to church, despite having a very happy life, I felt something was missing. I wanted a greater sense of spirituality and of deeper meaning in my life. So when Tom first started coming to church, apparently I, no, nobody knew he was coming. Slip into sacrament meeting in the back row, and, and, um, and then as soon as the closing prayer, amen, was said, I'd zip out and not speak to anyone. How I first got to meet him was I received a note that was handed to the clerk saying, 
some guy named Tom wanted a meeting with the bishop. I essentially said, look, here's the scoop. You know, I'm living with my partner. We've made commitments to each other. I don't feel like I can go back on those commitments, but I would like to attend church. And asked me what I thought was uh, a very frightening and very humbling question, uh, which was essentially, am I welcome here? And I immediately told Tom, of course you're welcome. I remember going to visit Tom once, <clears throat> and he, it was Sunday, and I, he says, okay, let's go to church. I'm going, wait a minute, what are you doing? What's Which going church? on here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and of course, he pulled us off to, to sacrament meeting, and everybody knew Tom, and he knew everybody. And I think that was my thought, too, visiting in the New Canaan Ward, was they didn't see, here's a gay guy. It was, here's Tom, a great guy. In the years that I was attending the New Canaan Ward, my expectation was that I was always going to be you know, the most active non-member of the New Canaan Ward. But, you know, that, there really was no place to go with this. Later on in my experience, um, I had a conversation with our stake president, Dave Checkett. At a certain point, I felt like I wasn't progressing as quickly as I wanted to, and he said, well, why don't you and I um, study the scriptures together? really strengthened my testimony to just spend that time studying with him. But secondly, it, it changed actually the whole way I was leading the stake. And I recognized that that was my most important responsibility in the Yorktown stake was to try to create Zion. There's a standard for entering our temples for those who are ready and willing to make covenants with our Heavenly Father. But there's a different standard for entering our chapels in my mind, it's really two things. One, a desire to come closer to the Savior, and two, the courage to push open the door. And in that sense, I wish the sign on our churches, instead of saying visitors welcome, would say all are welcome. Because that's really what I think about in our chapels, that we want everyone to be there. We love people where they are. We don't require that people change in order to receive our love. We don't demand that people show us progress in order for us to welcome them at church. What I saw was him starting to wrap his arms around the idea that he wanted to come back into the church. And that meant that he was going to have to make significant decisions, which he made about his relationships. The question that I wrestled with for months was, would God ask a differential sacrifice of me than of my brothers? that I should give up a full relationship with the person I love most in the world? And I think that's a question that every gay person has to take to the Lord for themselves. I've learned a lot of great lessons uh, from Tom about patience, about persevering despite knowing uh, where the path's gonna lead or what some of the answers are going to be, and relying on the strength of your testimony and your belief in the fact that your Father in Heaven and your Savior loves you and that you matter to them and that can help you get through a lot of very difficult things in life. I conducted the baptism, which he asked me to do. It was special because it was very small. All of his brothers were there and their wives. It was a remarkable spirit on that occasion. Bishop Larson baptized me and, and my brother Todd confirmed me, he gave a beautiful, powerful blessing. And then I asked uh, each of my brothers if they would just bear their testimony felt that we were unified as a family and that that was uh, a powerful example of the commitment that we had to each other. Now, at that incredibly important moment, we were all there together. One of the things that, that I really love about the doctrines, uh, the Lord expects us to ask questions. If there was any one thing I could change, it is that my LGBTQ brothers and sisters could see my Mormon brothers and sisters the way I see them. And that my Mormon brothers and sisters could see my LGBTQ brothers and sisters the way I see them. My heart is full to see you here together. 
All of us have hurts and disappointments in our past, but if we use these as opportunities for empathy and understanding, if we can share our scars with humility and love, together we can build a future that will lift each one of us. Knows what every other person hopes and needs. I think part of our earthly experience is the struggle, is the wrestle with trying to deepen our understanding while we walk in faith. It really is a question of personal discipleship. And I believe the closer we get to the Lord, the more natural that is. Um, he does not look upon sin with the least degree of allowance, as he says, but he does take us where we are and begins to work with us where we are. He doesn't say, you have to get to this level before I will love you, or you have to get to this level before you can have any help from me. Uh, I think it's real. I think it really, it's real, and we ought to all seek to, to, to draw from that, and not just for the sake of those we want to help, but for our sake, to be better ourselves, to be better disciples. And we're all in it together. You know, we really are. And uh, things that need to get sorted out, at some point, I guess, get sorted out. It's, it's a little like our seeking revelation from the Lord. You can't dictate to Him. You can't say it has to be now and in this way and so on. Uh, we can't always dictate a solution and a resolution of something that may be a conflict between us. We may just have to let it simmer for a time and, and keep trying. One of the things I love about the theology of our church and of Joseph Smith's example is that the Lord expects us to ask Him questions. It's how we gain our answers and also how we come to know Him. And even though all questions are not answered immediately, the most important question has been answered for me. I know that Jesus Christ lives, that He was resurrected, and I know that His atoning sacrifice plays a critical and continuous role in my life. So this has been my journey, and I wanted to share it as an appreciation to my parents and my family and my ward family, and in gratitude for the path that I have been given. And I hope that those who listen or see this will prayerfully seek their own path. I have been blessed through the gift of the Spirit to feel one with my Heavenly Father and with my Savior. I pray that this blessing of unity will prevail for all the children of God, that we may be one. Uh, we, we left this little white bread community in Pleasant Grove, Utah in 1960 and moved us back to New Brunswick, New Jersey, which was nothing like where we had grown up. The Pleasant Grove Chamber of Commerce will be on your case now. That's so true. That's that's don't true. worry about you, it. You that's can't true. go back there now. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, you yeah. robbed the grocery store. <laughs> so. Hold it. Hold it. <laughs> Talk. I, as, no, as, no confession of a as I have can't. To watch this program and many other inspiring KSL documentaries, download the free KSL TV app now from your preferred app store for all your favorite devices. Enjoy uplifting programming anytime, anywhere you want.